can you prevent a client from suing you if they contracted coronavirus from you? Today on the podcast. This is the Wedding Industry Law Podcast, a podcast dedicated to wedding professionals that are just trying to keep it legal. And now, your host, Rob Shank. Hey out there, welcome back to the podcast. Super quick episode this week. Before I get into the content, please, pretty please, with sugar on top, if you don't mind, subscribe to my YouTube channel. I am really needing 1,000 subscribers because that is the threshold that will allow me to do YouTube live videos from my mobile phone. And Wedding MBA is coming up in November, and I would really love to YouTube live from my phone, from that location. So that's my goal. I want to try to get 1,000 subscribers by November of this year, 2020. So if you could just mosey over there, hit subscribe, leave a comment. If you have any suggestions for content or any questions that you want to have answered, this particular uh, episode is because someone left a, a message on, on the comments underneath a particular video. So that's why you're getting this content because a question was asked and I like to answer those questions. So at any rate, subscribe. I'll be your best friend. Now, the question of the day, and I've, I've been getting this question more and more every day, is with contract language, can you have a client waive your liability if you get them sick with the coronavirus by going through with the wedding and, and, and providing services at a wedding? You show up at a wedding, you've got the sniffles, and it just so happens you got COVID-19, you give it to them. Is there something in your contract that you can have that prevents them from suing you because of that? What we are talking about is a limitation or a liability waiver. It's a, in the law, we call that an exculpatory clause or an exculpatory agreement. This idea of waiving liability, liability waiver. The issue here, folks, is, and I say this every week, but this week, I promise you that I really mean it. It is extremely state specific. And the reason why is because we are dealing with an issue that is kind of like a cross section of the law of contracts and the law of torts. And again, a tort is a civil wrong that's not a breach of contract. Defamation, intentional infliction of emotional distress, assault, battery, fraud, those are torts. Then you got breach of contract. This is where those two lands meet. Okay, and so that's why every state has their own special sauce. They got even more special sauce when it comes to exculpatory agreements, when it comes to liability waivers. But here's the general idea. Many states will allow two parties to allow one another or both to waive that tort liability. Okay, but but it's in degrees, it is degrees of behavior that you are allowed to waive in the contract. So what does that mean? What it really comes down to is there's the degrees of behavior we call negligence, which is um, something that you do wrong that an objective person says that you should have done. Then there's gross negligence, and then there's intentional conduct. So by way of example, Let's say that you're a florist and you're at an event and you're carrying your little flowers and you got this vase, but it's kind of heavy and you're not paying attention because maybe you're talking on your Bluetooth um, and, or maybe you're talking to somebody else, you're turned around and then you stumble because you weren't paying attention, you weren't being careful, you weren't being reasonable and you drop that flower pot on somebody's foot and it caused them an injury. That is typically what we would call negligent behavior. You didn't, you know, you, you weren't following the rules of etiquette of watching where you're going, paying attention to what you're doing. And as a direct result, you have harmed somebody. That is typically what we call and what we think of as negligence. The next degree over what we call gross negligence. Gross negligence is where not only are you not paying attention, but you've got headphones in, you're listening to Van Halen at volume 11, you're drunk as hell, uh, and you're not paying attention to where you're going, 
and you drop the flower pot. It's kind of like a couple degrees more egregious behavior. It's not just, you know, you messed up. It was, quote, unquote, an accident. This is talking about something that you're stupid, so, so stupid, and you caused this accident. That's gross negligence. The next step over in terms of tortious tortious conduct is intentional conduct. That's where the florist in the same example walks into the place, sees the individual in front of him and goes, I hate your guts and throws the flower pot down on them, intentionally throwing the pot down, flower pot down on somebody's foot. Negligence, gross negligence, intentional conduct. With liability waivers, exculpatory agreements, in, in many states, that first level, yes, you can um, have the other person waive your liability for ordinary negligence. In Georgia, um, for example, you typically can do that, okay? The, in terms of gross negligence or intentional conduct, almost no states allow an exculpatory agreement that would allow that. You can't, you, you, you probably are not going to do that. So those two degrees are typically, you're not going to be able to um, contract your way out of liability. If you in fact, uh, you know, are grossly negligent or intentionally hurt somebody. Okay. So with, with regard to like negligent behavior. Okay. Even, even then though, even if your state would allow that, there's also another threshold, which is, does it violate public policy? So, in for example, um, some states don't allow exculpatory clauses or, or waivers of liability, even for negligent behavior, if you are providing, um, uh, like, a bed and breakfast, if you're a venue and you do bed and breakfast and somebody is hurt, or if you're a gym like some some states don't allow uh gyms and and like the LA fitness can't have you waive your liability. Some states don't allow do not allow that. So there is not just the degree of conduct that is kind of like the threshold, there's the other threshold of some states will say, well, some specific services we're going to throw into the category of not letting you do that. Now, whether or not that's going to apply to you as a wedding professional, the public policy threshold is going to depend on what state you're in. Okay, but again, um, the idea is there and you, you see that in a lot of contracts, but whether or not it's going to work for you will depend on those two things principally, but some other things as well. So that is something to consider. Now, let's let's just assume for this for, for the rest of this podcast that you're in a state that's going to allow you to waive your liability for negligent behavior, and it doesn't violate public policy. Let's take it, let's, let's, let's say that you're in one of those states, okay? Let's, let's hypothesize about what this means with regard to COVID-19. Now, the, the principal bedrock of a negligence claim is what is the standard of care? Um, well, I guess I should, I should say I should back up a little bit. So if you're going to sue somebody for negligence, you have to you have to um, have evidence of certain elements. So there's duty, which do you have a duty to somebody else? In this instance, we don't have to worry about that. Then did that person violate the standard of care? Okay, so you got duty, standard of care. The next one is did was the standard of care breached? And then the last category is damage. Was the person damages? And so that's what I'm talking about. It's a, the standard of care is an element to a claim for negligence against somebody. So just I, I don't want to get all esoteric or all law school on you, but that's that's what I'm talking about when I say standard of care. Did an individual breach the standard of care? Now, the standard of care is going to be judged by what a reasonable person in a similar situation would do. It's called the objective standard. What would somebody, what would another florist do when walking into a venue um, in your situation? That's the standard of care. Now, we are in unprecedented times. And I, and I keep saying this every week when it comes to contract clauses. We were talking about force majeure and why our laws on force majeure will probably change because of the pandemic. But in this instance, 
we're talking about the objective standard of the objective uh, standard of care. Okay. What is reasonable during COVID-19? Who knows? Who knows what's, what's reasonable? Is it reasonable to expect a florist in 2020 during um, the pandemic? Maybe we're in phase one of like opening up the uh, opening up the community to businesses and events or whatever. Maybe there's social distancing, whatever the case may be. We're in we're in uncharted waters. So does that mean that the standard of care is, for example, following CDC guidelines? So does the wedding florist need to have a mask on? Does the wedding florist need to take their temperature before they go to that gathering? Does the florist need to uh, take a coronavirus test? These are going to be questions that are going to be scratching people's heads for a long time. What is the conduct of a reasonable person at a gathering during the age of the coronavirus with regards to whether or not they are negligent? Right. Because if I, as a wedding florist, I go, go to the event, I've got my mask on, which I don't take off. I wash my hands every time I touch anything. I maintain six feet of distance. I follow all the other CDC guidelines. Then it would hard, be hard for somebody to argue that you are actually negligent at all. OK, so that's what I'm talking about when we're talking about negligent behavior. What is negligent behavior? What is negligent behavior with regard to spreading infection? Now, my, my deal is this, is that, you know, and I, I sue people for torts or not people, but I sue companies for torts most of the time a lot. Okay. It's already hard enough. I don't know how in the world, how in the world anybody is going to be able to prove that you you having coronavirus cause somebody else to have coronavirus it would be in my i mean it could it could be possible maybe if you're the only one but i mean like it, i don't know that would be that's in my opinion that's that's going to be a tough one now i'm i haven't been in the mountain back i don't know but with regard to a a a client wanting to sue you because the allegation is that you caused them to get coronavirus i'm it's not impossible to prove. I mean, people can do it, but maybe, but I think that would be a difficult thing to do. Um, but I guess the reason why I'm bringing that up is because even if we're in that land where you're in the state that allows waivers of negligent behavior, and it's not a violation of public policy because we're in the when the we're in the era of pandemics, but typically. The only person that is waiving the liability is the person that signs the contract. So only the individual that you have that has signed that liability waiver, that exculpatory agreement, is going to be giving you the right to not be sued. Does that make sense? You, it's just because the client signs that waiver saying, I won't sue you if I get sick with coronavirus because you were negligent. Doesn't mean it extends to any of the other attendees or the guests, I'm sorry, the attendees or the other vendors. The only way that you're going to be able to do that, well, I'm not going to say the only way. It depends on what state you're in. However, there's going to have to be some type of, of agreement between you and whoever wants you're wanting to waive that liability. There's going to be either a document they sign, you, you're, you're going to have to have them, everybody sign off on the dotted line if you want that waiver, for the most part, if you want that waiver to work, Okay. So think about that as well. So it's not just a carte blanche walking into that event and thinking that you're free and clear as long as you're not grossly negligent or intentionally neg- or intentional, your intentional conduct is bad, that you're going to be off the hook because you're not. It's You have to have what's called privity of contract. Privity of contract. The contract obligations and rewards only go typically to the people that sign it. So that's why that's going to be important. So at the end of the day, whether or not you can have a client waive their right to sue you if they get the coronavirus from you will depend on whether or not your state allows the degree of conduct that you have committed, whether or not there is some type of violation of public policy, and whether or not that individual has signed an agreement with you. I'm going to throw one other one other. Um, 
twerk, not twerk, quirk, twerk, twerk, not, no, that's, twerk is not what I'm trying to say, quirk, quirk, not quark, quirk. The other quirk is this, this area of the law can change. So by way of example, your governor, the mayor, um, can easily, or your state legislative body can easily change the law to apply only to coronavirus, just like that. So by way of example, in the state of Georgia, um, actually in the state of New York and many states, there is now a law saying that if, if the medical provider is negligent in some way during this pandemic, during the crisis, causing any type of injury, then they are going to be either not liable or held to a much, much, much higher standard, which would make it impossible to sue them, specifically because of this pandemic. So keep that in mind as well. So even if you've meet all these criteria, criteria, you've met all these criteria that we've talked about, that contract law might change in an instant by a proclamation by your governor, your mayor, your state legislature. Does that make sense? So can you do it? Yes. There are caveats to it. Um, I know, just as an aside, some states, the wording has to be perfect or the judge is going to rip it up. The judge, the judge has authority in some states to just be like, no, this, I'm, you, this one thing is bad. You didn't dot the I here. It's out of here. Okay. So um, I'm not poo-pooing on these things. I am not, um, I'm not saying that you can't do it, obviously, because people do it every day. But just be aware that there is still risk. Please, please, pretty please, if you have a fever, if you have some type of respiratory thing going on, if you're coughing and it's not allergies, you got a fever, you, you get somebody to work that wedding for you, okay? Just please do it for re, do it for me. Tell them, tell them Rob said so. Um, but yes, you could probably do these things as long as you're in the state that allows it. Um, I think that's going to cover it. I think I've really beat that to death. If you have any more questions about this, um, you can shoot me an email, rob at weddingindustrylaw.com. You can leave a comment in our YouTube, on the YouTube channel. Um, what else? If you have any questions, not questions, if you have any suggestions for comments or, or suggestions for content, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, love to hear from you. Uh, and with that, thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much for listening. We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Wedding Industry Law Podcast. This podcast is intended for general information only. Nothing in this podcast is intended to be legal advice. Do not rely on this podcast for your legal matter. Instead, consult an attorney in your area. Thanks, obrigada, até semana que vem.